Rachel Lee is the World's, uh, World Bank's Vice President for, uh, sustain for the Sustainable Development Network, and uh, she's joining us by video link. Uh, EDC has known uh, Rachel and her work for a number of years, mostly from her days at IFC, International Finance Corporation, where she served at, as IFC's Director for Environmental and Social Development, uh, leading efforts to develop new sustainability performance standards. Through the Equator Principles, uh, as well as all the work that the World Bank does, these standards are now a global benchmark and are used by financial institutions worldwide, EDC included, uh, to review infrastructure projects for environmental and social impacts. Rachel has been in her current role with the bank since 2011, where she holds overall responsibility for the bank's global work in agriculture, environment, energy, infrastructure, urban and social development, has, uh, along with global public, good, public goods issues in those areas. Prior to appointment, uh, she was the IFC Vice President for Business Advisory Services and a member of IFC's management team. And she joined IFC in 2000. Rachel holds a Master's of Arts in International Relations from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy and a Bachelor of Arts in Politics and History from the University of London. So without further ado, I will be handing it over to Rachel. Rachel, just letting you know, I will be moderating the Q&A when you finish off, so I'm um, happy to do so. So, Rachel Kite. Thank you very much, um, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm really sorry that, um, that uh, Marianne is not there with you. Um, she had a family emergency, which meant that she had to fly back to France. And uh, I'm very happy to step in, but I too am sorry that I can't be with you in person. I'd like to thank uh, Dave Runnels and, and many other colleagues for uh, their leadership on sustainability over the years. Um, I take my hat off to EDC um, for its track record. Um, there is a very hot uh, green bond market at the moment, and we've noted with pleasure uh, the activity north of the border. Um, but what I wanted to do today is to try to put a few ideas down in terms of a response to um, what is a big idea for sustainability. Um, and I think uh, I, I should preface that with where, where we stand and therefore what we look for um, as we try to unpick the many multiple parts of what would be called sustainable development. As an institution, the, the World Bank Group last year uh, reconfirmed that our goal is to seek the elimination uh, of poverty. Uh, we've set ourselves a target of only 3% of absolute poverty by 2030. Uh, obviously, that's a target that can only be achieved together with all of our clients and partners. And that we should have a much more um, sustained prosperity. Uh, so the notion that uh, growth uh, must be more uh, equal in the way in which its uh, benefits are distributed, uh, something which has come very much to the fore in the last few weeks, certainly in the US and Europe, in the debate around how to get inclusive growth. So our vision is one of ending prosperity, building shared prosperity. But we've also recognized that those two things cannot be achieved unless we grapple with climate change. But I would say in the grappling with climate change, we're really dealing with a growth model and a development model that is pushing up against the boundaries of what is, what is sustainable from a physical environmental perspective. And so the question we have is, if over the last 20 years, economic growth has lifted more than 660 million people out of poverty and raised the income levels of millions of more. How can we bring forward generations of people across the world with the aspiration that they will do better and that their children will do better while protecting the carrying capacity of the earth at a time when climate change threatens to make all of that much more difficult than uh, would have been thought in the past? where climate change intensifies the variability of many of the systems upon which we defend, depend, and where climate change really has become an intensifier of the threats um, that we are already grappling with as a society. So in some respects, it sounds daunting. Um, and in some respects, it seems that we would need to have bigger or bolder ideas than we've ever had before. 
But I think what I want to say to you is that the ideas have already been um, birthed, as it were. These these ideas are not new ideas, but will what will have to be new is the political will, um, the economic decision making, and the narrative around why we need to execute on some of the ideas that we've had as a community over many many decades. So. Growth is too often today at the expense of the environment. Um, we have reached the limits of resource depletion in some areas. And we're moving towards rapid, dramatic, unpredictable impacts and irreversibility. Uh, the irreversibility, I think, is somewhat stunning when we think about what we do know and don't know yet still about the oceans and the impact of our depletion on those, the impact of our use of them, and the impact of climate change on them. Development gains have been, that have been made are at risk from the depletion of that natural capital. What that means is that it's difficult to imagine that we can keep on lifting people out of poverty in the way that we've done it for the last 20 to 30 years, unless we take into account um, uh, natural resource use and extraction more fully. And um, the development gains are continuing to damage the atmosphere, soils, clean water sources, forests, oceans I've already mentioned in a way which is also compounded by climate change. We cannot balance our economies and the health of the planet on the backs of the poor. Um, that is often the way in which policies arrive at the doorstep. It cannot be balanced on the backs of those who are hungry. We have 800 million people going to bed hungry every uh, night, and we have more than a billion people uh, under uh, undernourished, i.e. either... Um, suffering from 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 bad bad food or from from no food, and in fact uh, we're looking at statistics that we soon will have a situation where one in two people around the world will not be properly nourished. Uh, we cannot balance our economies and uh, and the health of the planet on the backs of those who have no water, and we cannot balance the uh, health of the planet and our economies on the backs of those who have no access to energy. So the growth model that we need to bring forward has to end the energy gap, energy uh, poverty gap. It has to um, allow for severely strained water resources to be able to be used by those who need it for the purposes that they need it, um, including agriculture. It means that we will have to find a way to establish nutrition security, even when agricultural systems will be challenged with a pathway of urbanization that we've never noticed, uh, never experienced before. And we're going to have to do all of that while continuing to raise um, living standards, which it means an awful lot of jobs for an awful lot of young people around the world. So is this possible? Uh, is it possible to imagine a more inclusive, um, a greener or cleaner growth? Um, we think yes. First, because it is about increasing efficiency. Recognizing how deeply inefficient current growth models are would be a good start. Urban sprawl and congestion, bad for the environment, but they make cities less efficient. They have huge public health impacts, but if it's a sprawling and congested city, the poor actually can't get to work easily and can't take care of their families and can't earn a decent wage. Congested cities work less for the poor than they do for the, for the rich. They make the life of the poor even more difficult. So we need massive investments uh, in innovative transport systems. It is the transport system that will detect, di dictate the former uh, shape, the future shape, sorry, of, of a city. We know that uh, those transit systems are at hand. We know that those cities which have invested in bus rapid transit systems or in light metro, light metro and rail can effectively raise the productivity of the poor, sometimes by as much as 20%. At the same time, improve the quality of air, improve the quality of cognitive development and education of children, et cetera, et cetera. So they offer win-wins. Um, what is difficult to muster is the financing and the political will to make large-scale expenditures when you can't quite paint what that picture of a successful, non-congested, um, cleaner air city looks like in the future. Fast-growing Asian economies have been leaders at expanding transit systems in this way. 
but just to keep up with the path of urbanization, this will have to be expanded. And it will critically have to be expanded into Africa, where the pathway of urbanization will be similarly fast over the next decades. There are major efficiency gains to be made, not just through transport, but through improving food supply. Um, so everything that we can do that helps us get uh, food from farm to table, from table um, to uh, the belly of a child, is a good thing. We can um, reduce uh, waste uh, by 15 to 30 percent in developing countries, even before it reaches market, by better investment in transport, but also storage solutions. There are multiple efficiency and health benefits to be had through renewable energy. In Bangladesh, World Bank and others are helping to solve low-income rural households' access to electricity. With solar PV panels delivering clean energy, making healthier home and work environments, giving families the chance to set up small businesses, improving community. In Kenya, where only 25% of the population still has access to electricity, it's through geothermal that now you will expect to see grid-connected uh, grid power being extended. And here, the, the, um, the innovation is not only in the way in which that's regulated, but the new financial products which allow for geothermal exploration to take place. So um, often when we're talking about sustainable development and we're talking uh, about the compounding effect of climate change, we always talk about the co-benefits to health or the co-benefits to um, economic growth or the co-benefits to, um, to development that come from smart, green, sustainable development or climate-related activities. I think, in fact, there are more hearts and minds to be won by talking about the smart development that, if it is enacted, if it is supported, can actually give you the co-benefit of emissions reduction, the co-benefit of increased resilience and the co-benefit of increased resilience of the natural environment, which will be so important to us going forward. But, and here's to one of the fundamental ideas, if not a big idea, if we are going to increase the efficiency of the current economy, and if we are going to increase the aptitude of the current financial system to finance the things that are actually needed and wanted, then we will have to find a way to get prices right. Green growth, like any other kind of good growth, requires good policies and it requires getting the price right. It requires fixing markets. It requires addressing policy and coordination failures. It requires the creation of tradable property rights, the reduction of inefficient subsidies or misapplied subsidies. A focus on the policies and investments that need to be made in the next five to ten years to sustain robust growth, to generate real and immediate local benefits and avoid locking unsustainable patterns in and costly public health cons with costly health, public health consequences is absolutely critical. <clears throat> we cannot afford the lock-in of a high carbon growth model that will be achieved by the investments today <coughs> in things other than what we really need which will come on top of the extreme inertia that is already within the current infrastructure that we have built, which is high carbon and carbon intensive, and which will mean that over the next 20 years, we will arrive at one and a half degrees uh, of, of global warming, uh, irrespective of any actions that are taken from today on. So the inertia and the uh, damage that we've already done is something that we simply have to now cope with through the growth models that we push forward. According to our analysis of some 40 countries, environmental degradation is on average costing countries the equivalent of 8% of GDP. A combination of reducing costs of degradation, increasing smart green investments can make growth affordable, greener growth affordable. Research indicates that for every dollar invested, between two and three dollars can be generated and potentially more. So it is an urban myth that environmental regulation costs. In fact, good environmental regulation allows the private sector and others to price in fairly early on the costs of doing business and pushes them to efficiency, uh, throughput uh, reductions in, in resources, etc., 
and is not the reason why economies fail to compete. Impacts on productivity, competitiveness and jobs are modest from environmental regulation and sometimes extremely positive because of their effect and spurring innovation. So how do we get greener growth? Well, first we have to put a price on carbon. It's essential to shift economic development away from carbon intensive means of production and towards low carbon and resilient development. <clears throat> the good news is that more and more countries and companies are beginning to take advantage of this trend <clears throat> towards lower carbon development and are seeking to be early movers. Many jurisdictions are implementing explicit instruments such as domestic emissions trading systems, carbon taxes or payments for emissions reductions. Others are working with implicit instruments such as taxes on energy, contents of fuel, performance standards for appliances or buildings and regulatory approaches that result in indirect payments for emissions reductions. Corporations are also integrating a cost of carbon into internal decision making to identify new investment opportunities and to mitigate risk and to prepare for a world increasingly inevitable where everybody is working, living, operating under a cost of carbon. <clears throat> I think that the uh, Secretary General's summit on um, climate leadership in September of this year has given an, a, a ne much necessary um, adrenaline shot to the discussion around carbon pricing, uh, whether through taxes or through trading systems or, or other market-based mechanisms. And we expect to see the, the pace of change uh, really pick up. But carbon pricing alone is not enough. You need other instruments to be mobilized in parallel that will help redirect investments away from brown and into green, into new technologies and sectors, and into new way of doing things. The two sets of instruments are particularly promising. One is in sort of the good old fashioned setting of performance standards, and the second is in financing. Performance standards that increase energy efficiency can have a measurable impact on emissions and produce major economic and development co-benefits. Local air pollution down, energy security up, trade balance vulnerability managed, household expenditures uh, down, uh, increased industrial competitiveness up. So we know that good old performance standards for appliances, for buildings, for, for uh, cars, uh, all of these have a very positive effect. Um, and we know that countries that lead this from the center and lead it from the top and really put a premium on efficiency, drive efficiency through the economy much faster than those countries that allow these things to bubble up uh, from below. Uh, the International Energy Agency estimates that government policies and supportive frameworks drove an estimated global investment in energy efficiency of about 300 billion in 2011. Now, the question is, that is way too small for the size of the task that we have ahead of us. And so how do we bump that number up? So it's interesting, as Canada is choosing not to price or regulate carbon, uh, are more stringent performance standards a way for your economy to go? Maybe so. They can have a higher political acceptability than emissions targets, since they don't immediately affect existing industries and equipment, only new investments. Many countries already have performance standards for some equipment already, and therefore they're used to using it and can extend it elsewhere. And they can have measurable results over a shorter time span than sometimes emissions targets will do. But at a time when the Secretary General of the UN has asked every country to come and make its contribution, and uh, make clear its contribution to glo the global climate challenge in 2015, but is asking for leaders to own their own ambition in terms of how we will work together as a collective and for, to, come to come to the UN in September and lay out what each country may wish to do or where their ambition lies, then for a country like Canada, it will be interesting to see where indeed Canadian ambition lies. Now, for this swivel, this pivot in the economy from the risk of being overexposed in brown because not just of future prices on carbon, but because... It, that brown economy is bad for human health, bad for the natural environment, bad for uh, the sustaining uh, systems upon which we, we, we depend. And as we move then and hopefully send price signals and, hen and send signals within the economy towards that greener future, we also need a financial system that both 
uh, correctly appreciates the risks and, op and opportunities in that shift. So we see uh, all kinds of uh, innovation within the financial markets, uh, both on the public sector and private sector side. Um, the advent of green investment banks um, in, at both uh, the national level in the UK, for example, but also at the state level, uh, for example, New York, is, is something that is um, gathering momentum. And certainly the early days of those green investment banks seem to be positive. We see um, a huge response from the financial sector to the proper setting of public policy. <coughs> Excuse me, whether that's in tax relief, whether that's in incentive payments, feed-in tariffs, or elsewhere. The numbers that we've seen for Morocco, as Morocco has pulled back its harmful fossil fuel subsidies and put very clear incentives in the economy in place to drive investment in renewable energy, we've seen renewable energy investment in Morocco move from 2012 to 2013 from 300 million US dollars to 1.8 billion uh, US dollars. So it just shows you that there is investor appetite. And if the investment climate and the signals are clear, then we can see that finance flowing. At the same time, we do know that regulatory risk and the uncertainty from uh, on again, off again approach to regulation uh, for sustainable development, for renewable energy, for uh, uh, differences in, in methods of farming, for example, can have a paralyzing effect um, on, on investment flows. And in fact, um, you know, one reversal of a public policy decision will do more to damage uh, investor appetite than, than any other equivocation. So in conclusion, the world needs uh, a green and inclusive growth. It cannot be achieved without a tackling climate change. And tackling climate change means that we have to price carbon. The sooner that the mechanisms are in place to do so, the better. The better for companies, the better for countries, the better for our health, the better for our agricultural resilience, the better for the mangroves and the natural systems we depend upon to protect us from natural disaster. Um, if we can have these mechanisms in place, so investors will be able to guide investments in the short, medium and long term uh, without the risk of stranding their assets and leaving their investments high and dry in a high carbon um, set of uh, investment portfolios. In the meantime, even as we work to price carbon, performance standards, green financing instruments can change economic structures. And we know that from certain countries, those changes can actually start to happen quite quickly. We can help reduce the cost of green technologies and increase the acceptability and effectiveness of the pricing of those things which are bad. So none of this is new. We've been talking about uh, internalizing externalities, putting prices on things which are global bads for a very, very long time. But we have not been able to execute at scale and we've not been able to come together as an international community and operate at a global level. We're going to need solutions bottom up and top down and hopefully the top and the bottom will meet somewhere in the middle. That somewhere in the middle is sustainable development and the biggest and boldest idea that we need for sustainable development is that there is a narrative that can be built up around it, which means that you can make the short term political decision to support decisions today that will not lock you into the wrong future for, the, for tomorrow and that the short termism of politics can live side by side by the long termism of the kinds of investments we need in green infrastructure and in a different agricultural system and in the management of coastal areas and in the management of our oceans, that those two things can happen at the same time. But for that, the biggest idea that we all need to find solutions to, or the biggest idea we need to resolve is where do we get the political will for that generation of leaders that can build the narrative that makes it make sense to the electorate that they don't have to choose between a job and the protection of the environment, that they don't have to choose between their future or the kids' future, that they can vote for somebody who can make long-term planning decisions with costs associated because it will be better for them today. Very few leaders have been able to magic up that narrative. Very few of us in the environment and so sustainable development world have really focused on the fact that our narrative is getting in the way. 
And some of the biggest ideas that we will have to have over the next few years will be how to bring more people into the story and make sustainable development about the shape and size of our economy, not just about something that is thought to be a threat to that economy. Thank you. Pass one. Um, do you have a few minutes for questions? I'm not sure of your Absolutely. timing. Fantastic. We've got some uh, roving microphones. Do we have a question out there? At the back, we have a question. Uh, maybe just loud voice, and I'll and I'll re and I'll say it again for Rachel. And I'm curious, is there any idea about, is there such thing as enough? Do we need to grow the economy forever? Or do we reach a point at which there is enough? And an increasing share of the economic growth is now going to the wealthiest individuals. So in the United States, it's yep. the richest 1% has accumulated 95% of the economic growth since the recession ended. So presumably they don't have enough because our goal is to grow them bigger. So I'm curious, when is enough? Can we ever stop growing? Go ahead, Rachel. Uh, yeah, well, I think that th this is very uh, important, um, and certainly we think that you uh, or we need to achieve the greenness and the inclusivity of that growth at the same time. Otherwise, it becomes um, a zero-sum game where those who don't have uh, their basic needs met will always see the call for more efficient economic systems from an environmental perspective, they will always see that as a threat to their aspirations. And so you get this, this argument between the haves and the have-nots. Um, and so I think there is some very interesting work now coming out of those who are looking at what we call you know, the circular economy that we can, um, that we need to imagine how we are going to have zero footprints or uh, zero waste from different processes within the economy. And I think that what's exciting about that new area of work is, um, and I, I, I'll give you an example. So I've been working with some analysts on, in the financial markets in London, and we were talking about, you know, how you, um, you know, what's, what's, a, what's a sustainable stock? You know, wh where do you want to invest if you care about uh, long-term risk management and sustainable development. And up to now, the narrative has really been that you would want to invest in the most corporately socially responsible firm or the firm with the best environmental uh, loss control and social um, uh, standards. Um, but in fact, um, as we were debating this, you know, you can argue that you could be the most environmentally and socially responsible manufacturer of a product uh, which is disposable, i.e. therefore not sustainable, and that that would actually be a worse investment than in a company that maybe today was using a technology for a bad thing, but that that technology would be extremely useful in a sustainable world. So the notion would be that actually a Halliburton share is more sustainable than a share in Nike. Now, up to now, we've all been enthusiasts, right? You know, Nike is driving water out of its supply chain, reducing uh, costs and pollution um, and socially responsible. And, you know, Halliburton is one of the poster childs for an industry that people love to hate. Um, I think that we have to think uh, very profoundly about the circular economy. Uh, and hopefully that, that will, that, I think that will provoke some, some new thinking. But have we got enough? Um, I think that if you internalize externalities, um, you get to a much more efficient place without setting up green in opposition to inclusivity because that conversation or the fear of that has meant that in the G20 and the G8, now the G7 acting as the G8, um, that, meant, that means that I think very little progress has been made over the last five years uh, and we need to make a little bit more progress more quickly. So not a complete answer to your question, but I think it's the, it's the nexus of issues that we shouldn't lose sight of. In the middle. 
Hi there, uh, Dave Keith, Harvard University. Um, this may come out of left field, but I'd be interested to hear your reaction. You said the same things that we at IPCC have often said about irreversibility and about commitment. But of course, that's only true if you assume that you can't do solar geoengineering. And I'm wondering how you and others begin to think about that now that you have the UK Royal Society, the IPCC, soon the US National Academy, effectively saying that with risks and uncertainties, you could do it. And so the kind of traditional statements we've all made about irreversibility are just not technically correct. I'm interested to know how you think about that. So I just, just to make sure I heard you correctly, you said uh, geoengineering. Yeah, I mean, there, there are lots of reasons we might not want to do it, but, but clearly the statements that we are committed to warming are not true, even according to the IPCC text, because it says that it, uh, it will work at least to do that. Yeah, so I think the, the issue is that, um, um, uh, that we, we need to be in the second half of the century at, at some at carbon neutrality. Um, it's difficult to imagine how you get to carbon neutrality either without uh, what well, you would need uh, at least solar battery storage technology uh, at scale um, in order to make uh, to make uh, some of the advances in in, in solar um, base load and, and take a much bigger sh a part of the energy transition than it can at the moment. It's difficult to imagine how you get to um, carbon neutrality without nuclear. Um, and it's, you know, and for some it's difficult to imagine how you get to carbon neutrality without geoengineering. I think the, the point that I would make about the last two things is that the sort of R&D and then the deployment and then the proof in the public, um, the public imagination around risk are, are going to be very long processes, right? So, you know, even if we decided, even if a country decided today that its risk appetite for nuclear had come back, and even if it started to uh, invest in new technology nuclear plants now, you know that's not going to be available at scale for, for a while. Um, and to get it on the kind of scale that we need across a number of countries, that's going to take quite a long while. And so I, I think that you've got a, a, a temporal dimension to this, which is that you know, by, given that we're already in 2014, um, you know, where are we going to put the effort um, in order to arrive at where we want to be by 2050? As a World Bank group, we're watching the geoengineering conversation with some with interest. We don't have a, any specific uh, views on it. Um, I mean, it's, it's not something that we're needed to invest. We're not needed to invest in it at this point in time. Will it be part of the solution? It may well be, but I think that my focus at the moment is on the um, on, on what we've already built into the system which then has to which we have to live with over the next 10 to 20 years um, and how we're going to do that do we have another question out there everyone was taking notes during your talk they're still uh, processing in their minds um, Rachel just maybe if so, Rachel, you're speaking my language, the world of financial institutions and, and the challenges. You know, um, who should we be looking to as, or who would you say is out there that, that is really um, progressive, is, is showing leadership in this area, um, either countries or uh, institutions that you think, beyond the World Bank, that you think are really nailing this issue? Um. Well, I, I, I think I, I don't know if any of us are really nailing it. Um, I, I think amongst the multilateral investment banks, I think the European Investment Bank is is running the fastest at the moment, which in some ways makes sense given its shareholders. Um, but I mean, it's in terms of a, an investment bank that has got its arms around the challenge and then moved forward aggressively. I think that they they should get credit. Um, I think that, you know, you mentioned green bonds in your opening. I think that the, to watch the European utilities issuing green bonds where, which are truly asset-backed, right, and which are truly in bringing in new retail investors into the green space, um, these are, these are the, the most impressive of the green bonds, right, because they are, they are 
showing that the finance is flowing back into green assets and that it's bringing more people to the party. So that's, in particular, Electricity de France and Iberdrola, the two utilities that have issued um, very good green bonds. <coughs> and Iberdrola's issue was, I think, 400% oversubscribed. Um, so huge interest there. Um, and I, I think there, there's, a re there's a real challenge to the long-term investors and the pension funds who have been asking for places to put their funding uh, so that they can um, diversify into sustainable investments and diversify into low carbon um, and also need to diversify geographically. I, I think that they, um, they're still um, highly concentrated in Northwest Europe and highly developed markets and the conversation between them and between asset managers and project developers so that they are able to put their assets at, 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 to, to be able to be exposed in the countries and markets and to the kinds of projects where their funding is really needed. Yeah, you know, we've had lots of generic conversations, and we, I think those are starting to get more specific. Um, but there's a lot more to be to be done. Um, you know, we just had a huge argument with our own pension fund here in the World Bank Group, and the UN is doing the same about how much. Um, we can continue to meet an old-fashioned description of a fiduciary benefit, beneficiary, I mean, fiduciary um, responsibility. Um, uh, and uh, I think that we've, um, I think we've started to have some small victories. But there is this uh, tension within the financial markets between long-term and risk, and uh, and you know the definitions that we've been using for the last 20 to 30 years. So I think there's a lot of people doing good stuff, um, but we haven't, in any one segment of the financial markets, been able to uh, move everybody to scale yet. Um, I think there's huge issues for the endowments of uh, academic institutions and others as um, young people today uh, ask, ask a different question. The question they're asking is, well, why is it a good idea to be diversified into um, oil, gas, and coal? Um, um, and I think that many campuses are obviously struggling with that divestment movement at the moment. Thanks for that. We're going to keep you for one more question. In the middle there. Thank you. Uh, Rachel, in the last year, the emergence of the carbon budget conversation has changed a lot of, a lo a lot of calculations being made. And for a country like Canada, given the size of the oil sands, it's an extremely important conversation. And I'm wondering, you know, there's a lot of calculations being made by GDP, by uh, per capita calculations, and if you can tell us your thinking on how, when we say we need to leave two-thirds of the carbon in the ground, how some of the ways you see that playing out at a national level and the calculations uh, that we should be looking towards. Yeah, I think, I think the conversation is moving very fast, as you said, and um, some people are using the budget uh, analogy uh, and construct. Um, some people are, are not. I mean, I think the, for those who don't like using the sort of budget analogy, it's because they're not quite sure who's the budget authority, um, and you know, um, and who would be the budget authority for a conversation that sort of tells one country that they've got to leave a bunch of stuff in the ground and and allocates that space to another country. So we, we're always going to come back to the problem of how do we globally govern this uh, this this dilemma. But I think what's really exciting in the last year has been the speed with which the, um, the conversation around risk um, has taken hold. So the conversation around the carbon bubble, the conversation around stranded assets. And I think the, the questions to be asking are, you know, if you are a uh, jurisdiction, whether sub-sovereign or sovereign, uh, if your pension holders... Um, are exposed um, to a significant degree to uh, companies uh, whose profits are coming from, from uh, coal, oil, um, uh, you know, and if you imagine that there will be prices on, though, on carbon within the next X many years through whichever mechanism, you know, is, is that a risk to you? Is that, is that if, and if, if the balance sheets of those companies depend on the exploitation of those assets, and if those assets are not going to be easily exploited, what does it do to the valuation, and then what does that do to the risk of the exposure? 
So I think that that started off as a conversation amongst a few people in London and then a few people across Europe and North America and Australia. And it started out with then Carbon Tracker and then the carbon budget papers that were put out and investor calls to certain countries and uh, to certain companies in the oil sector. And it's now already morphed into a conversation with central bank governors, a conversation with financial regulators, a conversation about when would this be an appropriate issue for the finance, finance safety board, the FSB, in Basel to discuss. So I think that um, the evidence is not absolutely clear, and the evidence by jurisdiction needs to be studied and evaluated. Um, but the speed with which this, the, the sort of tail risk of being high in the brown economy is, 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 is quite something to, to watch. Now, from a development perspective, our, many of our clients have deeply brown economies, you know, Poland, Mexico, Indonesia, for example. Um, but uh, we also have a new generation of countries who've just um, found oil, found gas, um, and found alternative gas in some cases. And they're struggling with, you know, how do we exploit this resource for development, for, for, the, for our domestic development purposes? How do we exploit it for foreign exchange, from export, etc.? And, and do we really, how do we do that if, in 10, or in 10, 15, 20 years, this is going to be a, uh, we're, we're going to be at risk as an economy of being a stranded asset as well, so overexposed to uh, a currency in the energy world which will be of less value. So we're doing some macroeconomic and so advisory work with um, a number of countries now looking at, you know, what the risk and the opportunity is from how they manage those, um, those resource fines. So I, I think this. I don't think we know at the national level. I think there's lots of questions to be asked, but these are questions that um, shareholders should be asking. They're questions that investors should be asking. That pension holders should be asking. Trustees of pension funds. This means that a lot of people are going to have to get real smart about what is, you know, what is one of the greatest long-term risks to not just economic stability but also to financial stability. Uh, and so said. Uh, so said. Um, Christine Lagarde at, uh, at the conversation on climate risk that we had during the spring meetings of the bank and the fund. So this has gone from being something that you know a few socially responsible investor NGOs were talking about 18 months ago, two years ago, to being something that now um, the head of the IMF, the head of the uh, Bank of England, uh, Good Canadian, um, and um, the FSB is, is likely to be talking about in the next year. Here with that, thank you so much, uh, Rachel, for uh, stepping in and uh, being so available for both for speaking and the Q and A. And uh, I'd like everybody to join me in a round of applause. Thank you.